Zach, can we bring this up? Everybody got testing one, two. Can we bring it up? There we are. You want to test John's mic too? Everybody got so quiet. This testing. Is, this is a fun, noisy, interactive session. So let's practice. On the count of three, just chit chat with your neighbor. One, two, three. Uh, very good. There's some collegial conversations that just happened that have not happened in years. I love that. Totally love that. Well, thank you for braving the elements. Uh, one of the students in the fellows class yesterday said, in order to prepare for the introduction, Hasna, if you were there, Hasna Hashim, she, she made an amazing introduction last night. And she said to me, in reviewing the previous introductions to this Tuesday morning session, to prepare for her own. She said, it's funny how so many of them begin with you, Al, saying, thank you for braving the elements. Thank you for, but we're really grateful to John Keane for, uh, since yesterday was kind of mucky, sh schlepping down um, from northern New Jersey to be with us. Um, he was here with us as all Calaritas House fellows are all day Monday for a reading last night and a dinner, and here again. So the first thing we need to do is put our cold but about to be warmer hands together to thank John Keane. Thank you. Thank you. So what's going to happen in the next hour and five minutes or so, um, and I say that because a lot of people, it's a, it's a Tuesday, people have stuff to do, and we're really, you know, we're devoted to the idea that this will be a, a filled hour, but we're not going to do what some programs do, which is, you know, at noon we'll start thinking about whether we're done. Um, and in the, so in the next hour and five minutes, um, I'll ask a few questions uh, of John. They'll typically focus on particular texts, which is, I think, a favorite thing to do. Um, and, uh, and then, and, and at a certain point, we'll open it up to your questions or comments. This is not necessarily a press conference. This is a uh, give and take. So if you have some thoughts about your reading of John's work or follow-up questions from yesterday, or for those of you who were at the reading, who heard a, ch is it a chapter or a section? A uh, section. A section of a new novel. Uh, you might have questions about that. Uh, and then uh, at the end, I'll, I'll conclude with a couple of, a couple of final questions. And John has consented, generally speaking, to um, read a short passage or two th in this next hour. And I wanted to begin, John, with um, the sentence I mentioned effusively at dinner last night. Mm -hmm. um, you know, as an encore um, of sorts last night, you read Manahatta, which is the first story in Counter Narratives. Oh, I'm sorry, I didn't do my basic homework. We are selling copies of Counter Narratives. In the back, I think Tasha is selling them, I'm not sure who, in the living room. Um, I think it should be required. Yeah, there's one <laughs> snap. I I'll say that again. I think this should be required reading. About six snaps. We're getting there. Um, Thank you. Because of the very concept of the nar you get the narratives in school, and maybe you should get the counter narratives and so forth. And it's available. It's a New Directions book. I can't imagine it's too expensive. And I hope you'll get one. And then at the end, John has a few minutes after, and he'll st he's agreed to stay here and sign inscribed copies. We also have copies of this extraordinary novel, novel um, annotations. Um, which is a, a New Directions book that was published in 1995. And we, the Writer's House fellow students, and I had the privilege of really hearing the deep background on how John got to the point of being brave enough to write this disjunctive text about a life. Um, and uh, this, too, is available. So anyway, I was effusively saying something about a sentence. First of all, I love all your sentences. And I, I said at the beginning or end of class yesterday that it's so such an honor to meet a writer who is great at the level of the concept and great at the level of the chapter and really great at the level of the paragraph and then also write sentences that are utterly fabulously difficult and memorable. Thank you. Uh, you're welcome and, and thank you. Uh, so the sentence I had in mind <clears throat> is in Manahatta and I thought I would ask you to read it, just the sentence. And then you and I can talk about what's going on there. It's page four, and it's the one that begins yawn. 
And I guess the key here is that um, readers of John's work know that names and naming are really important, and names are typically fluid and multiple. So, <clears throat> let me see if I can do this. Jan, as Captain Mossel and the crew on the ship called him, or Juan, as he was known in Santo Domingo, or João, as he had once been called by his Lusitanian sailor father and those like him, among whom he worked, the kingdom, kingdoms of the Iberians being the same in those days. And before that, mm, the name his mother had summoned forth from her people and sworn him never to reveal to another soul not so distant, it struck him from the Makadewa, the envoy of the first people had begun to call him had stilled his ear like a tuning fork until he captured it, and with the key of this language that most of the Dutch on the ship assured him they could not fully hear, he had himself unlocked the door. I think it's probably easier to follow visually than orally because of that long uh, sort of, you know, um, what do you call it? Uh, a, a compiling of noun clauses or something like that. Right, the, 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 with the, between the M dashes, that uh, suspension. Oh, yeah, right, yeah, right, yeah. With yeah. the subordinate. Well, there's, there's only, so there's one, it's a, it's a, despite the super M dash after the M, which is the name his mother called him, but we can't know as readers. Right, right. Or was, actually, maybe it's an M dash, but it's the, the, the way. But the then thing. there, that's the only M dash. The right. sentence piles up and then gets a single M dash. Right. Well, I mean, I, I guess I'm thinking there's like I can sort of there's no maybe there isn't one that opens that long that sort of chain of names. Yeah. But uh, then it, it uh, the M dash actually connects th um, what follows with everything that's come before. And what follows is had stilled his ear like a tuning fork until he captured it. Right. Now it is. Like, you got to publish with New Directions or some experimental press to have the editor not circle that and say, what is it? Well, I should say that the, the editor, well, this will this will tell you how great my editor is. She actually, because when I first wrote this sentence, the way that I described the tuning fork was wrong. And she said, that's not how a tuning fork works. Really? Yes. And she said, this is how a tuning fork works. So she actually corrected that, which is why editors are great, they do what they, what they do. So this version actually has the correct... Um, That's wild. Yeah. So she corrected the tuning fork, but she left the totally ambiguous it alone. Right, right, exactly. Okay, so I guess I want to talk about the totally ambiguous it, because it could be the sound of all those different names as this person tries to construct his own identity, mm -hmm. but technically it refers to the previous sentence which is the, two, the melody of the indigenous person who right. appears like through a door in the, is it bayberry? Through yeah. a bayberry bush. Right. So the, it's the sound of the melody. Of the language of the Lenape people. So the language of the first people is this key, and the Dutch can't hear it. They can't, they don't, it's like a language that they, does, they can't process. Just they assured they can't, him. Right. They could. They were admitting to their inability to understand the indigenous melody. Melody. Right. 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 And Jan, Juan, Zhao, Joao, right. uh, or M. Right. Uh, it stilled his ear. That melody stilled his ear. It's not as if he got it. Right. He had to wait until he could capture it, and then the Dutch. Somehow you jammed back in the Dutch who didn't hear it. So right. there's all kinds of stuff about having a name that can be heard, that can be known, that can't be known. Right. Which is related somehow, not in the grammar of the sen logic of the sentence, but related somehow to the multiple nameness is, is related to the melody that he's going to try to understand. Right. What, what people hear and don't hear. I just want to say that, you know, it's interesting. Uh, recently, Roots was on, and there, there was that scene. I, I mean, I think I was in like seventh grade when it came out. That iconic scene where, uh, you know, Kunta Kinte, played by LeVar Burton, he tries to escape, and then he's captured. I mean, I think, ev like, Everyone I knew who saw that scene, I mean, it's like the like one of the, like of all the things in Roots, I mean, any things in Roots that people remember, but the, the one thing that they all remember is, you know, the, uh, so the, the slave owner has Kunta Kinte tied up, and so he's strung up, 
And he has, of course, there's a black person whipping him, and he beats him and he, to get him to say, to take his new name, Toby. And he keeps saying, he beats him, and he says, you know, what is your name? And he keeps saying, Kunta Kente. And so, I mean, he's bleeding and everything else, and of course, all the other enslaved people are just like horrified. They're sitting there watching. And of course, Chicken George, who's been like his sort of pseudo-father, yeah, yeah. is just like, I mean, he's pained because of course, because he, he even goes and argues and says, well, I mean, he has, he's trying to figure out a way to prevent him from being beaten. And uh, he says, uh, oh, you know, he appeals to the slave owner, and he says, you know, he's, he's really good, he's really strong, he can work the fields, you don't want to beat him too badly. And he says, I'm going to, he ran away, and you know, how dare he defied me. And he says, then he g g makes it a, totally about an economic argument. He says, you paid so much money for him. You can't beat him to death. And the slave owner just says, I don't, you know, it's like, I'm, I am the, the power and I'm going to demonstrate to everyone, everyone, black, white, everyone, that I am the, the ultimate arbiter of this man's life. So he's beating him and beating him and he just refuses to say his name is Toby, right? He refuses to give up that identity, right? He refuses. And then finally, when he's basically, you know, nearly beaten to death, he's, he says, Toby, the guy, guy, the overseer gets right up in his ear and says, What's that? and I, so I, I've all, I mean, I think that's always in the back of my mind, like, you know, just this idea of naming and who has the power to determine one's selfhood, one's being in the world, one's, you know, sovereignty, how, how that's controlled by names and how you know, the sort of names that people have for each other, this, what I think of as kind of secret names. And so, and that's almost like that mm. secret language, right? Yeah. Just even, just even hearing this other way of this, this melody, this other way of communicating in the world to him is a kind of signal or key, right? And like a tuning fork, it stills his ear. So he doesn't, ex he doesn't hear he it. Can, it stills his ear until he can hear it. Right, right. It's a kind of, the Manahatta, which is the first piece of the book, is kind of a prologue. It's kind of setting out the terms. Right. Because there are many characters. Boran Bunda, Boran Bana is, the, right. is the most obvious of the characters who insists on self-naming. Right. But here, you said at the beginning, you were just being modest, that you know it's easier to read than to hear. Mm -hmm. But actually, this is all about the sound of language as opposed exactly. to... Exactly. Right, yeah. right. I wonder if you wouldn't mind reading the rest of that section, which is on page four, because it picks up this whole theme in a way that I think is really, really interesting. Okay. And it gets to the point where Jan, um, or whatever his name is, learns to hear the natural things around him. So I wonder if you can go from where we left off down to the end of that paragraph. To door, yeah. okay. So and this takes us to, you know, the quintessentially um, American concern for material goods and consumption. <laughs> Pelts for hatchets, axes, Knives, guns, of course guns have to be there, right? More efficient than flints or polished clubs in felling a cougar, a sycamore, an enemy. He had wrung a peahen's neck and roasted an entire hog, but despite having heard several times the call to revolt, he had never revealed a single secret or shibboleth, nor had he killed or been party to killing another man. So long as the circumstances made it possible to avoid doing so, doing, doing either, he would. Some day, perhaps soon, he knew his fate might change unless he overturned it. The, en the envoy had, through gestures, his stories, later meals and the voices that, smoke, that spoke through fire and smoke, opened a portal onto his world. Jan knew, for his own sake of survival, he must remember it, enter it. He had already begun to answer to the wind, the streams, the bluffs. As he now sat in the grass observing the light playing through the canopies, the shadows sliding across themselves along the sedge in distinct shades, all still darker than his own dark hands, cheeks, a mantis trudging along a half bridge of a gerardia stalk, he could see another window inside that earlier one, beckoning. He would study it as he had been studying each tree, each bush, each bank of flowers here, and wherever on this island he had set foot, he would understand that window climb through it the the conceits are like there's four or five conceits operating at the same time which is why i love this so much john the 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 um indigenous envoy comes through as it were a door through the bayberry mm -hmm. yawn he learns to hear and that unlocks a door then the envoy had opened a portal 
into onto his world. I presume it's the envoy's world, mm -hmm. the, the world of Manhattan. Right. And then Jan knew for his own sake that his survival, for his survival, he must remember it, and there's another it. Right. And the it would be... The language, the door, that connection, right? How to make sense of this world that's, that's opened up so that he can leave the Dutch. And then linguistically, he can answer to the wind and right. the streams. Right. To the landscape, to, the, to his, his entire um, sense of language, of selfhood, reorients to this new landscape which isn't the landscape that he grew up in. The world it's so in. great. It's everything right there about language. Uh, John, uh, Samuel R. Delaney, Chip Delaney, was trying to make his way here today, but probably started to slip slide and decided to watch you know, on the video stream or whatever. But I have a, a Chip Delaney question for you. OK. So I know uh, uh, Delaney is an influence. I believe he is an epigraph somewhere. Has he got an uh, epigraph? He's dedicated. He's a part the book is dedicated. Yeah. Yes. So I wonder um, which of these stories, if, if somebody pressed you and said, okay, which is the most Afro-futuristic, Delaney-esque, or Delaney-influenced story in this book, which one would you say? All of them. <laughs> All Meaning of them. the influence is that Oh, yes, it's tremendous. Strong. It's tremendous, yeah. yeah. Um, cold. Mm -hmm. That's, that's sci-fi-ish in a way. <laughs> It is. I mean, it's interesting that you like the issue is you think of that one as sci-fi-ish. Um, that to me was that wasn't. I'll say this. So that was not a story I was planning to write originally. Um, the impetus for that story came because, uh, and I think I've said this in, in uh, interviews before, that Dorothy Wong and I were ex she, like you know exchange things we find on online, and she found this horrifying sheet music i mean really i mean it, it, which is so fascinating now that of course with the you know the uproar around uh governor northam and uh, lieutenant governor uh, uh mark herring in virginia and of course it was the guy in florida uh and uh, some, someone else i guess another big one of the big um uh, sort of major republican figures so two democrats and uh two republicans right with in blackface this whole this whole issue of blackface keeps popping up. Well, anyway, so Dorothy found this minstrel sheet music, and we were just kind of horrified, right? And so uh, it turns out that it was um, one of these things on, in, you know, university archives. And so I went to the archives, I looked into the sheet music more, and we went back, kind of went back and forth about the person who wrote it, was who was a guy named Bob Cole. Right. And I was, of course, surprised to find out that Bob Cole not only was African-American, but it turns out he was a major songwriter. And he wrote, um, among, among the many songs that he wrote, um, I think it's called Under the Banyan Tree, um, that appears in the famous movie Meet Me in St. Louis. Mm -hmm. So if any of you all have ever seen this movie, it's a, it's a really wonderful little movie. Um, and the movie basically is Judy Garland is one of the one of what I think what four sisters and their father they live in St. Louis and their father gets an offer for a job to move to New York and uh, the uh, all of the sisters are really like kind of upset they don't want to move to New York of course because they want to stay in St. Louis and the World's Fair is about to happen of course you know if they'd had good sense they would have moved to New York because that was probably the height of St. Louis is you know uh, greatness or something, but anyway, so it's, it's a it's a fascinating little movie, right? And um, but there's this one moment where uh, Judy Garland and uh, I think the actress's young actress then was Margaret O'Brien, their sisters, you know, the second oldest I think and the youngest, and they dance the cakewalk in front of this. Uh, um, Christmas tree, right? And it's it's wonderful. They da they dance the cakewalk and it's syncopated and they do the little dance and they have the, you know, like minstrels, but there's no blackface or anything. Well, it turns out, of course, that this song had been performed in blackface musicals and Cole not only was a songwriter uh, in blackface musicals, blackface minstrels and musicals uh, and stuff, but he also performed. So he put on a cork because, of course, many African-Americans to, you know, uh, basically make a living then decide, because it was so popular they then put on blackface even though they already had uh, brown skin and Burt Williams was one of the most famous so right. long story short then at later on in his life Bob Cole uh, who had been a songwriter with uh, J. Rosamond Johnson 
whose uh, brother James Weldon Johnson wrote the Negro National Anthem, the Black National Anthem, and was a very famous writer. Rosamund Johnson was also a famous composer. They then decided, okay, we're going to try to write pro-black musicals, and they were never as successful. Your shows, and they were never successful. And then Cole had a complete breakdown. So I thought, oh, my God, there is so much of what, 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 what's always happening in America in this one man's life story. And the fact that he uh, drowns himself in the Catskill Creek was, mm-hmm. was also especially fascinating to me. So then I tried to you know, sort of compress all of that into the last day of his life. And he's the the reason I mentioned it. I use the word term sci-fi, which is not the right term, is because he can't get the sounds of the music out of his head. It's exactly, a, it's a disease of some kind. Exactly. So it's a he basically he used to be able to think of these songs without an uh, without a problem, but of course now they keep not only crowding his consciousness, but they're sort of playing all at the same time. So basically, you know, the, I guess the composer, famous composer Charles Ives, you know, right. turned this into high art, but it wasn't right. working for Bob Cole. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I'm glad to hear that uh, Samuel R. Delaney's influence is throughout the book. Does it make that makes a lot of sense? Yes, I mean, and one of the books. I mean, he's got a number of books uh, that were uh, major influences, but one of them in particular uh, that I really, really loved was. I mean, I love all of his work, but uh, his no, his novella Atlantis Model 1924 mm. uh, is was particularly. Uh, influential on me, hmm. and I, I can say that he actually at one point he came and uh, he came and, and read in Boston, and he stayed with my partner and I, and he went um, through my bookshelf and uh, was taking notes. You know, I saw yeah, he, yeah, he was yeah, taking yeah. Notes. We've seen that before. Right? Yes, and then he actually wove some of the things that he took the notes he took into Atlantis Model 1924, and it's an it's a marvelous little story about when his father comes up to New York. Um, uh, from North Carolina, and uh, he, um, you know, sort of uh, experiencing New York, but also he weaves in um, the story, I think, of Hart Crane and of a, of, of, of a famous, I'm blanking on the name, uh, Russian, young Russian Jewish poet, uh, and but and of course also magic. I mean, you know, like as Chip always does, like all of these things are woven in there, along with, po- you know, like snippets of poetry from other poets. It's just, it's really remarkable. So. Yeah. He is great. Um, I have two more questions, and then we're going to open it up. Uh, Lily's got a portable mic. Um, I wonder if one of the students wrote something really terrific, um, and rather than translating it into a question, I thought I would just read what she wrote okay. um, and ask you to respond. What she was focusing on in, in, in our class, and we talked about this with you yesterday as a class, um, the students were um, amazed and gratified by the uh, ex- the experimentalism of the writing and the, the daringness of it and also how it made reading difficult. Remember we had that mm-hmm. conversation and how, according to this one student, the technique that you use lessens the urgency of correctness, which students today, especially you know, really great, accomplished, A-plus getting students, they feel such an urgency to be correct. And in a way, incorrect isn't the right word for, you know, prose such as the it having no antecedent. But let me read you what she says and see if you see what you respond to it. Um, she wrote, this form of storytelling raises questions regarding the ethics of literary analysis, by which she means conventional literary analysis, as she's been taught. For the digestive slash interpretive might not be as essential as the somatic. Mm-hmm. This technique also lessens the urgency of correctness for the narrative is already distilled through an emotional state rather than a train of thought, as evidenced by the repetition of words and phrases with memory-related connotations, short chapters, and the muddled pronoun usage. Keene uses the process of pulling and shrinking vocabulary in order to prioritize art over accessibility. Had the reverse occurred, this work would not exist in its, in its, in its entirety. Well, so let me say several things. First of all, the, it's fascinating that, that uh, uh, to hear, I can't remember the exact uh, quotes, but I mean, the number of people who said to me, I mean, in fact, my next door neighbor bought, bought a copy of this book, and um, this was many, when it came out, and he said, you know, I had to get a dictionary to read that thing, you know? It was like, I, I loved it, but it was, it was really hard. Uh, just recently, my godparents, 
after I won an award, my godparents asked for a copy of this book, and uh, you know I sent it to them, and you know wrote out you know a nice little dedication, and they actually I said they don't have to, you don't have to read it, and of course they read it, and they were like, whew, it's really hard. It's like you know. The, the vocabulary, so it's sort of fascinating to hear well, you know, that, right. right? You know, um, but but the other thing too, I think of is in terms of the muddledness of of the pronouns. I mean, I think I think of it more as mutability. I mean, as I was saying, you know, at the time I was writing this book, that it was the heyday uh, of uh, theory, and it, interestingly enough, now of course, uh, you mean annotations, annotations, right? Uh, and um, you know, queer theory, as we understand it, was coming into being. I think you know, LGBTQ studies was still kind of the the the, the field in in that in that area, and um, we talked a little bit about you know critical race theory, how big that was. I mean, that was I mean you know there was all kinds of stuff happening around you know critical race theory. Uh, you probably remember all the drama, at, you know, for example, Harvard Law School, right? Yeah, and uh, there you were up in the area. Exactly. Um, uh, and of course, you know, you think about like the sort of shifts in you know um, feminist studies and um, you know Marxist studies. I mean, all there was all this stuff in the air, and then of course deconstruction was still such a big thing. I mean, you could, you could not in many places, particularly many elite universities, you could not at that by ninety five, right, ninety four, ninety two, ninety three, ninety four, ninety five, you could not get out if you were studying you know liter- you know English American literature, comp lit, anything you know, even many you know uh, well, Spanish, Portuguese, etc. You were probably reading some Foucault and some Derrida and some Demont and Baudrillard and some of the you know a lot of these people out to there. So I say all this to say that I mean the the very idea of the decentered subject is behind the what seems what may seem like muddled pronouns, but actually it's like the kind of you know mutability of self and she meant as, muddled in a positive sense, right? <laughs> and 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 it's and a, and, a, and a kind of decentering, right? Because what does it mean t- to write a autobiography or an autobiographical or memoiristic text in which you rarely use the word I? I mean, isn't that I think that's you use it once key. at the end? Maybe? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yes. So I mean, I was I was really sort of, sort of inter- about you interested in that. I mean, what does it what does it mean to write about the self, but not write about oneself, right? Yeah. Um, and to try to write, you know, as deeply into that selfhood in a, in one way, but as one of the students also pointed out yesterday, which I loved, to also have it be somewhat abstract. And and Philip Brian Harper has actually written. Uh, he, he's written about. Um, Phil Brian Harper at NYU has written about uh, this book and really has beautiful comments about thoughts about the, the sort of ab- the way that it engages in the kind of abstraction as a way into thinking about blackness and um, and 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 selfhood. I'm so glad you mentioned the um, theory moment because the book ends with your move from St. Louis to Harvard, mm-hmm. where you entered that it was the beginning of your literary education, Harvard itself, and then you stayed afterwards and got the real sort of more communitarian literary education. There's, on, in the very last pages of this book, annotations, you're on your way to Harvard or you're thinking about it. And to some degree, the narrator also can look back after Harvard. So mm-hmm. there's all kinds of things going on there. Right. And one of the comments, which I take to be somewhat snarky, uh, and that the word perceptive is ironic, is it is foolish, the perceptive film theory no- theorist noted, for them, them, to invoke postmodernity when as a people they appear to have been bypassed by the modern. Mm-hmm. So that's a racist theorist, I think. Actually, no. Okay. It's not, wait, it's actually, I don't mean a race theorist. I mean a theorist who referred to them as people who weren't ready for modernism, let alone postmodernity. Is that what you're saying? Well, he's being ironic. Oh, I'm glad to hear that. Yes, it's actually, I'll tell you, that's Clyde Taylor, and it, he famously said at the Dark Room, he was amazing, right? Uh, he's someone who should be read a lot more, but he used to come to the Dark Room uh, readings, and he was like, you know, because we, we would not only have all these, you know, young writers and uh, musicians and artists and whatever, we'd have like, you know, some older folks too who were scholars, and, uh, you know, Clyde Taylor was one of those people, and Mary Emma Graham was another. Yeah. And uh, Clyde, I remember he famously said, I can't remember who was speaking, but he said, you know, how can black people be postmodern when they haven't let us be, we haven't been allowed to be modern yet, you know? And he was being ironic because, of course, clearly, you know, you, there would be no modernity without 
black people, right? You know, but what he was saying is that in the in the in the writing of of modernism and modernity, right? We're often occluded, and of course, you know, you you have people like so many. I mean, so many people have come forward to make this case. I mean, you think about Sylvia Winter on the one hand, or Paul Gilroy on the other. I mean, you know, he says, you know, basically, you know, the um, you know, Black Atlantic is the sort of counterculture of you know. Your modernity, right? Yeah. You you cannot have your modernity without the slave trade, right? This trade in bodies, right? right? The commodification of black bodies. So I mean, you know, I, I think that's that's what's what's going on there. It. But of course, I but I wanted to also highlight the idea of the postmodern and race because of course, as we know, I mean now it's the postmodern is so passe, we have a you know, postmodern fascist president and people are just kinda like, Oh, well, you know, we, it's like, oh, what what is he going to do today? <laughs> you know, are we going to have a, you know, is he going to launch a war or, you know, is he going to, yeah. I mean, who knows what, 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 what that person's going to do. But anyway, so <laughs> it's, it's kind of like the baseline. We had a postmodern election. We have a postmodern, yeah. frightening postmodern president. But in the nineties, yeah. this was still a point of contention, right? yeah. you know, in yeah. newspapers and, uh, you know, magazines, like what was the, the, that great, um, magazine that used to cover academia? Z- Lingua, Lingua Franca, Franca. Yeah, that's yeah, right. Yes, that. you know. Thank you, Ron. And that was this was like a <laughs> like a constant, you know, topic of conversation. Yeah. Like yeah. The, the you know, yeah, the threat of post modernity or the dangers of post modernity or you know, uh, yeah. This uh, just one follow up, uh, uh, and then we'll, uh, we'll get some questions from everybody. The, the, this um, this self constructed person, mm-hmm. you know, John Keenish person who leaves St. Louis to go to Harvard, has some mixed feelings about it. Uh, there's a line here, who would leave the city of one's birth without hesitation, mm-hmm. which is not a question mark. Right. Um, someone's quoted, I assume a family member, Harvard don't keep on folks who can't pay or charm their way. Mm-hmm. There's some warning to you. You're giving yourself the warning, but it's, but it's going to the university that allows you to achieve the self-construction that's celebrated at the end of the, of the in the very end of the book. Um, would you, do you want to say more about that double feeling uh, of that move? And it sort of, ina- it, it led you later to Dark, to dark Room Collective, so obviously it was a great move for you, mm-hmm. but not without complication. Well, you know, I mean, I think it's, uh, you, you, it, it's always a question of, you know, you, well, depending on what your, your, uh, class formation, racial formation, you know, uh, gender, sexual orientation, you know, your your background, wh- whatever that is, and the sort of, in, you know, environments that you move from, right? Yeah. You know, the, the sort of world that you know to the new environment that you move from, and, you know, the, the challenges, I mean, I think there's challenges for many of us, uh, uh, and this continues to be the case. Uh, I'm sure there are people sitting in this room, students walking around this campus who are thinking, you know, you know, how am I gonna? How am I gonna get to tomorrow? Right. <laughs> you know, why am I here? Why did I? Why did I decide to come here? What am I doing? You right. know, and then of course, because you know, you're not just in one place; you're in multiple places. You're thinking about, you know, where you grew up, who you grew up with, people you knew, the you know, life you lived, and it w- might be a very different life than than this world, right? Mm-hmm. And the concerns of, you know, an elite institution like Penn or Harvard or or even, you know, I mean, or even you know where I teach Rutgers Newark, right? Um, you know, there I have many students for whom like the very idea of going to college is a kind of miracle. Mm. You know, they're like I'm here. You know, and and it's it's always a challenge, right? Um, so, I mean, I guess I I, I want to sort of de-emphasize so you know the 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 personal and sort of think about it in broader terms, like sure. to sort of you know pull back, uh, you know, sort of I guess pull back the lens or um, uh, sort of pan out to suggest that it's not so much about me as it is about a kind of larger experience. And, and many, many people have written about this. I mean, it was an amazing book just recently by uh, Kesey Lehman, you know, um, I think it's called Heavy, where he talks about, you know, um, his background and going to a place like Millsap College and Millsap's College. Is it Millsap or Millsap's College? In uh, um, Mississippi and his experiences. And I mean, in, I mean, it's, you know, not my experience but there are many resonances there yeah. right yeah. um and that's a that's a brand new book so this is something i think yeah. people are writing all the time yeah charles blow in his memoir does the same thing at the very end i mean right. it really ends with the beginning of his education it's 
sort of a time-honored tradition. Mm -hmm. um, and the whole idea that this is basically uh, life notes aspiring to the condition of annotations, which is what you were saying before. It's not so much a John Keene story as how a person constructs themselves. Right, right. Yeah. All right, Lily has a portable mic, uh, and we can go anywhere in the room, right, Lily? Yes. So don't hesitate, don't be shy. We have a question here on the bench. Good morning. Good morning. Hey, Good morning. thanks so much. Um, I'm curious, uh, just thinking about Delaney in this book of uh, deconstructed autobiography, whether you were influenced by um, Emotional Light and Water. And I'm also c curious, just larger, like um, what sort of relation, like mentor relationship you had with, with Delaney and things like that in general. Well, yes, I was uh, influenced in part by Emotional Light and Water. I mean, I think that's one of the most you know remarkable uh, memoirs I've ever read, um, and there are many good ones out there, <laughs> but he's he's definitely at the very top. Um, we never we've never sort of worked together. He was never my teacher, um, but he's a writer that I've admired deeply since I was actually you know in my uh, early twenties, and I had one of my first public readings was with him at the Darkroom Collective, and I was saying a, a friend of mine, the writer Tisa Bryan, and I had actually gone to see him before that I think at MIT, and we were just like you know riveted like just to me because I think why well, before that right before that I had uh, an another great writer Ishmael Reed as a teacher and that was for me like the most remarkable thing because you know I knew there were black writers I mean I grew up as a, as a child of the 70s you know we had anthologies of you know black writing black arts writers and um, I think even on my yearbook page you know, I quote uh, Amiri Baraka and um, Gwendolyn Brooks so I was aware of black writers but to actually see them I mean I didn't you know you see yearbook pages can be like that <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, well, I mean, yeah, you can, you can, you can look you online. You have control over your yearbook page. That's right. what you've just. Well, implied. I mean, yeah, well, people have control. They they know what goes on their yearbook page, right? Things don't just pop up. But anyway, um, so you know, so so I was aware of of, of the of writers out there, and you know, was reading them. Uh, we I didn't get them very much in school, but sort of outside of school, you know, had a kind of counter education, as many uh, uh, people did in the seventies. And then when I got to college and had the opportunity to study with Ishmael Reed, that was, of course, that opened up all kinds of vistas. Um, and then when I got involved with the darkroom, of course, then, you know, it was all, uh, yet another education because, of course, all these writers, young writers were coming in and older writers were coming in. And I was saying, you know, at that time, and people who are now actually quite famous, people like Elizabeth Alexander and Paul Beatty, uh, Yusuf Komenyaka, and, of course, Terry McMillan, people who were very established. Alice Walker came through. Um, but anyway, so I met Delaney, uh, you know, at the, at this reading, and then read with him, and then over the years we maintained a friendship. I mean, always of deep admiration because I think he's really, really one of the most extraordinary uh, living writers that we have. Um, and I always read his work and uh, try to to learn something from it, you know. And he's he's always <laughs> more daring than almost anyone else I know. I mean, you the the man the man write stuff that I, you know, I just almost sometimes say, it's like, how, how do you do this? I mean, it's not even just like how he writes it, but the subject matter, because I think so often we think of, when we think of, um, you know, innovation and experimentation, we often think of form or genre and, you know, de-emphasize content. Yeah, content is pretty radical. In yeah. I mean, is, is there another book like Dahlgren anywhere? Yeah. Is there another book like... Um, through the Valley of the Nest of Spiders right. anywhere, no, yeah, or yeah, the yeah. Mad Men, yeah, <laughs> no. <laughs> so, oh, there are many. I mean, there there are many. There are writers. So you know, I I teach. So I have many writers that uh, I've worked with as undergraduates or graduate students. There are other writers that I've never you know taught, had the opportunity to teach, but um, you know, I sort of counsel them and you know urge them to keep going uh blurb their stuff um you know try to help them get published so yeah i mean there, there are quite a few and i think it's actually very important it's, it's very important i'm also i should say involved with the african poetry book fund which takes as its mission publishing work by um new and sort of emerging and established poets from um africa so primarily anglophone sub-saharan africa so i think we've the african poetry book fund has been around for 
I want to say six years, five, six years. And I mean, they've published uh, quite a few books. They have chapbook series, a senior poet series. And every year there is at least one new book by an emerging poet. And now they've started to do translations. So there are uh, poets, you know, writing in, um, you know, not, not writing in English, right? In other uh, European and then non-European languages that, uh, that are coming into print, so yes. And your own translations is another way in which you can reach out to young writers that you care about and feel should be better known. Exactly, exactly. So just to give one example, one of the writers I recently translated for, uh, there's a uh, Words Without Borders special issue on Afro-Brazil, and uh, one of the, two writers actually, that I translated, uh, one is Cristiane Sobral, who's a young Afro-Brazilian uh, woman writer, amazing. Uh, and she's got a, she's got one poem that is like one of the best. It's, it's like the the like super feminist poem. It's like I'm not gonna wash the dishes. I won't wash the dishes anymore. You you have to read it to see it. It's it's stunning in both Portuguese and English. And another writer uh, who I've translated uh, is Jean Willis, who was the sec well, the second out gay legislator in Brazil's um, Congress. And uh, he's a writer and um, a TV was a TV personality and a really amazing uh, politician. And he actually has just had to flee Brazil because uh, he's received so many death threats um, since the the new uh, administration took over. I mean, they were he was antagonists with Brazil's president when Brazil's president was a congressman, but now he's received so many death threats uh, that he he's had to leave Brazil. Thank you for the question. Uh, another question, Lily's got the portable mic. She can bring it to you. Hello. Hello. Um, thank you once again. Uh, it's been another awesome program. Good morning, Darby. Good morning, Al. How are you? I'm great. Um, so I was wondering, um, so a lot of the forms that you use in counter narrative are mm -hmm. counter narratives are so you know counter narratives themselves mm -hmm. um, they're experimental and interesting forms um, as well as your content and I was wondering so you, you know you use things like the double columns in uh, persons and places or people and places you use the footnote in gloss the ellipses in blues and I was wondering which tends to lead for you in creating counter narratives and experimental stories? Does the content or the sort of story or narrative Great idea question. lead, or does the formal choice lead? Because um, they're so intimately, intimately intertwined. Did you think of the two columns first, or did you write the story and then realize two columns would work? Well, it, it, so I'll say it this way. I often will have a kind of a structural... Uh, sense in my head of a story uh, but what I've learned to do as I've gotten older is to just sort of play around and sometimes I'll have an idea of the the form will be the guide and then I realize it's just not going to work sometimes I have the content and it's like well what would be you know uh, what would fit this what would what would match this what would be the best vehicle for this so it's usually uh, I would say I know this is a <laughs> problematic term in writing you know today, or maybe not anymore, but organic. It's sort of an organic process that the two evolve. <laughs> but um, uh, we've got a, you know, a lit crit person here. Um, but, but yes, yeah, it's, it's an organic process, I would say. Uh, they, they evolve together. I mean, sometimes, of course, it, it really is a subject matter. So just to mention persons and places, I, I, thought, that, I thought of that as a I love that little story, but I thought of it almost as a kind of throwaway story. And when I gave the manuscript to New Directions, I said to the editor, to Barbara, I was like, you know, I've got this little, you know, so almost like a placeholder story in here. And she said, no, 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 I think it's fine. And that was suggested almost completely by the idea that in his famous book, Persons and Places, because a lot of these stories actually refer to real books, right? Yeah. In, in George Santayana's Persons and Places, which yeah. is one of this, another talk about a very strange yeah. memoir. It's very strange, right? It's absolutely, it's like a fascinating book. Um, he's talking about his life and, uh, you know, it's, uh, he gives these little vignettes and stuff. Uh, some of it is, is so unforgettable. Like he describes this, I had never heard of this, but he describes this person who had a condition in which when he became excited, he would just blurt things out. It's called automatism. 
I was reading this and I was like, what? You know, um, but there's all this stuff that's sort of burbling beneath the surface because, of course, he can't really talk about his queerness. So he's talking about all these friendships with these young men and he's describing them and he describes this one young man who used to love, love to do needlepoint. You know, I mean, but, but, but he, can't be, he can't say anything openly, right? So, but in this entire book, he's talking about, he, there's many discussions of his students and stuff like that at Harvard, but he never mentions W.E.B. Du Bois which I thought was fascinating because he was Du Bois's teacher. And by the time Santayana wrote this book, Du Bois was actually quite famous, right? And I said, maybe I missed it. Mm -hmm. So I went back through the book several times to see, and he never mentions him. But he talks about all these things that are are of interest to W.B. Du Bois. And in Du Bois's, you can even find it online, there's an audio clip where he talks about being a student at Harvard and he talks about, he's got that very sonorous voice. I love his yeah. voice. And he talks about, you know, being a student and studying with Santayana, right? And uh, in the uh, David Levering Lewis's biography, he mentions this, I which a line I kind of re, um, reformulate. He and Santayana upstairs sitting side by side reading Immanuel Kant. You know, he Unbelievable. And I, he and I alone in an upper room. So I thought the idea that, not that they were, they're sitting side by side, right, that, that contiguity, and I imagine them walking past each other, you know, in opposite directions like this. I don't know if you can see yeah, it, but two columns. Down the street, and they see each other, but they don't know each other, right? And that is, there's some, there's something happens in that recognition, non-recognition, Right, because it's not just Du Bois seeing Santayana, but Santayana also sees and reckon and no and knows that Du Bois is some is not just going to be any student. He's going to be a student of significance, as he as he turned out to be. So double mutual invisibility, right. really, really mutual amazing. invisibility and multiple consciousness, double consciousness, too. which is totally relevant. Right, that's amazing. And you thought of it as a throw off. I'm I, glad that New Directions it insisted because it it's a great piece. It was piece. a very short. I mean, it's like what two, two or three piece. pages, you know. And then, but every so often, I'll have someone will say to me, "I love that. That's one of their favorite stories." But no, yesterday we, John was with us in class, and John and I think Amber Rose read it simultaneously. Yeah, it was wonderful. And when you hear it simultaneously, you begin to hear one say, "I saw this person across the street. This person across the street," and they sort of sonorously interact but the columns are separate. It was really great. I think Amber Rose might have a question. She's way up front here. The aforementioned Amber Rose. Hello. Good morning. Um, okay. I have sort of two maybe, rela maybe related questions. Um, the first is thinking about the form of this short story. I'm wondering about... Which one? The one we were just talking about? Yeah, mm -hmm. counter narratives. Um, but the whole collection of stories mm -hmm. and novellas. Um, I'm wondering if you think about any any ways that these stories are related to one another or if there is some kind of um, new way of thinking about kinship or, or global community or something that's happening in, th in the ways that you've placed these stories all together mm -hmm. or if you think of them as totally separate. Um, so that's one question. And then sort of related, and in regards to really all of your writing, so much of it is driven by poetry. Mm -hmm. um, and so I guess I'm curious about, to hear you talk a little bit about poesis as a way of making that it, that expands out of just the genre of poetry, but how that really influences how you approach all of the writing that you do. Okay, those are great, great questions. And I would say that uh, probably far better than I could do it, uh, Julian Lucas, um, a young critic at um, the New York Times, he writes sometimes for the New York Times and uh, New York Review of Books, he did a review of uh, counter narratives in the New York Times. It was sort of fascinating that uh, when the book, the year the book appeared, uh, it received not a single a review from a major newspaper, except of all places, the Wall Street Journal. Wait, <laughs> counter narratives? Counter narratives received not a single review. I mean, no major U.S. newspaper reviewed it, except for the Wall Street Journal. So several years later, strangely enough, the uh, New York Times decided they were going to review it, but and they but they picked an amazing reviewer, and he basically talks about how most one of the things he sort of in a, let me try to reframe this. Part of what he says, this is like a profoundly queer book because this is one of the rare books that, in which 
it is not centered on a single family saga, right? That is usually the way that it, you know, and particularly when it comes to transnational uh, discussions of you know, sort of race and history, et cetera, it's usually one family that is the connecting thread. And here, it's it, it's rhizomatic. I mean, I, that was in the back of my mind. Again, this is some of those theory things, you know, Deleuze and Guattari, <laughs> the rhizome. Right? You know, the stuff is all, you know, it's in your head. It's, you know, even if you're not thinking of it, it's, you, you're thinking of it. And so, like, the kind of, I think of this almost as a kind of rhizomatic um, uh, relationship uh, between these figures. So they're not directly connected, but they're corrected in a um, affiliative and um, uh, uh, non-direct but associative fashion, I guess that's the right way of saying it. Um, and so their resonance, as I was saying yesterday, that in each of the story, each story has a as a twin, right? And so again, there's a, another kind of kinship in the story. So the figures twin, or styles twin, or structures twin, or something twins one story to another story and it's not like a neat twinship or neat because you know i want to disrupt that which is of course really what, what queerness is about right i'm thinking about queer in the really sort of expansive sense that eve kosofsky sedgwick describes it in uh, queer and now that really sort of remarkable uh, essay um so yeah so i i see that i see this as being i mean this is one of the reasons also to to sort of follow up on what you're saying, that uh, in some reviews of the book, particularly overseas, they describe it as a novel. They say it's not a book of stories, right, uh, but a novel, which I think is sort of fascinating. Um, and it can, and I'm really interested in that, that it's sort of a, a sort of associative narratives, right? Um, narratives that where you have these sections that don't even seem to be um, connected at all, right, or very loosely connected. I mean, I think of, you know, someone like Javier Manrique or uh, Roberto Bolaño. I mean, there's, there's, there's a tradition of this. Um, or, of course, I was saying uh, just the other day on Twitter, we we're talking about, well, although it is one family, but uh, the, the confounding, you know, The Sound and the Fury by William Faulkner, right, those four narratives, which are clearly, it's the Compson family, but People, some people pick it up and are like, what the hell is this? These things don't seem to be connected or at Gene all. Or Gene Toomer's Kane. Kane, right, exactly, exactly. Um, so so I guess that that that's my answer to the first question. Um, remind me of your second question. Poetry. Poetry, oh, yes, poesis. Well, I, I was thinking about this, uh, about, um, I always say that, you know, you used to always kind of sort of joke that anything could be a poem. And I think you know, uh, or you could you could make poetry out of anything, or anything could be a poem. And um, I think some of the most exciting and innovative poetry, you know, to come along, has happened over the last what, 60, 70 years. I mean, I, I we could go even further back, clearly, because I don't want to, you know, uh, leave out the you know the poets of the turn of the century, turn of the twentieth century. But there's just really like, remarkable things people have done in terms of poetic innovation. Um, and the and possibilities of poetry and anti poetry too, you know, taking your genres. I mean, I once heard um, uh, what was his name, Jahan Ramazani, uh, the scholar who teaches at UVA. Come, he came to Northwestern when I was teaching there, and he gave this really amazing talk about um, the incorporation of non poetic discourses into poetry, right? Uh, and how um, you know poets are doing really interesting things with you know the uh, you know the discourses of, of of the law and of um, uh, you know medicine and uh, you know sort of non poetic things we would not would not usually associate with uh, poetry as well as of course other sorts of forms and genres and he you know one of the people he played was the uh, Afro British poet Patience Ag Agbabi so I was, I was just sort of thinking about this you know just just all of the possibilities of po poetry as a practice opens up. And uh, in, in my way of thinking, that applies to what we call fiction or prose too. I mean, there've been all kinds of innovations in prose, clearly, you know. <laughs> Let me not put prose, you know, uh, leave prose out of the conversation. But I think that, you know, that's something I'm always mindful of. It's like all these possibilities, these things have opened up. And um, and I see it, you know, as a uh, province of, of, of where, to, where I might be, my work might play. So, speaking of poetry, um, I think we're going to 
end the session um, by asking you to read two pieces. Okay. One would be a poem from Seismosis. I mean, partly because I really love the book and want to get it into the record of this hour. Okay. Uh, and the other would be uh, a passage at the end of Aeronauts. So um, the, the, the book is a collaboration with Christopher Stackhouse, and it's hard to find this book, alas. Um, it's out of print. It's out of print, and uh, there's only a few copies circulating. And I'm so embarrassed that you're going to read my copy, which is full of notes. Please ignore okay. the silly things that I say. Okay, so the, the poem is called Reflex, and you can't see the stack house. Yeah, I know. You can't see the stack house drawing. Um, but I think, John, this is such a marvelous poem because it anticipates so many of the concerns of counter narratives in a, a prose poem. So, would you mind reading it? Sure. Reflex. Memories. Blah, blah, blah. Reflex. Memories, borders turn, always returning. In the return, what is dissonant binds them. What they resist, they harbor. What they ignore, they engage as a deeper synthesis. The images strive but cannot depict this surface. The omitted return strengthened returns and replicates its diffusion throughout all layers. In the image, the mirrored intimate boundaries erode, held the erasure stains. In the return, the repressed is energy is loosed as the eyes are pen's method of addition. Constraint releases faltering resonances. Loss. Every loss upends memories remains. Leave the edges and nothing adjourns. Lost trains of images return. Marked, the journey from point to point begins, lengthens in the imaginary plane. In the disappearance, the intimate recedes, abstraction, departure is no haven, the past over transposes and holds fast, moored. The dissonant refrains, the trembling loss, score memory's borders. What was cast away retains its power, stain. Actually, I know we were short of time, but can I read just one one other poem? This Please. is this is this. Okay, so this is I think it's called Mo Apoesis, uh, and it means Mo stands for Modus Operandi, and Mindy Obadike, who's referred to the the uh, Mindy and Keith Obadike are amazing uh, poets and and uh, artists. So anyway, this is like a uh, Modus Operandi. Okay, ours poetic, I guess. Mo Apoesis. Thinking and wondering how to stutter, poetry. Thinking and wondering how desires armor her, how the pages unfold or position, yearning. In public as quiet without power or armor, the backs of her poems struck silence, stuck and lost so, or scooping up and working that out of shy and felt and separate. How do they stand? to dedicate myself to message and process after talking. Do that, I didn't do that. To sheer poetry, share it. Little notes on the backs of her promise opening, a fierce circle of thinking up front, presenting. Things found written on the screen on presence itself, thinking wheels, writing. The group, conceptual as art is, shit peeped, yet never said before her thing, things think. To, to roll, to have a roll, going all hard and reeling paper reels and sticks in their imagination lies. All that in one place, on it, onto it, in it. Whom will I gather? Gather into these folds. And then actually quotes a certain hip hop artist. So I'm not gonna name him. Um, John, the, um, for, if you're looking for a for, four word line that says so much about your work, the omitted return strengthened. Yeah, it's, it's, it's everything. Um, yesterday we were talking about the story Aeronauts, and you said, oh, well, that's sort of the most straightforward story you know, in the collection, maybe the least experimental. And then we began talking, and we realized that the so at the end, the character soars upward, mm -hmm. and it's associated with his freedom but the prose soars as well. And so there is another instance of form uh, commensurate with content. So we thought we would conclude your visit with the last two paragraphs, okay. if you don't mind, okay. of Aeronauts from and Counter Narratives. And the characters uh, in a, air, a hot air balloon that has, whose tethers have been uh, severed, and so he is floating 
from the Union lines uh, on the north side of the Potomac River uh, floating out over the Confederate. He's headed towards floating out over the Confederacy on the south side of the Potomac River in Virginia. During the Civil War? During the Civil War, right, in 18, I think, what, 61, I think. Um, While all around, 1862, while all around me the sky is churning between silver and mother of pearl and below the rigid grid of the federal capital, circling it on all sides, verdant countryside, the hills and meadows, the farms and homesteads, the bends of the Oka River, some of it Virginia and some of it Maryland, one direction straight to Pennsylvania and the other to the Carolinas, one to the Atlantic Ocean and the other to the Bull Run Blue Ridge Mountains. I can barely hear Mr. Edward Ulysses and the others calling out to me, their voice is growing ever more distant. Theodore, Theodore. And I sit in the center of the basket as it grows colder, knowing now that I am tethered to nothing at all, the basket and me now in a free float, a drift, a soar. And I stand and remember, can see out there all the forts and encampments and troops massed like tumors along the river banks, the ramparts and howitzers armoring the hills, the works teething at the edge of the foliage, the terrible danger sinking, sna- t- terrible danger snaking through the vast green and brown rolling land. And I feel something not quite fear and not quite elation. I can't put a name to it. I try to utter it but cannot. I place my hand on the valve string, then reach over and check that the sandbags are in place, pat my winter coat, feeling not only the weight of my papers and my pocket watch, but my heart when my throat finally relaxes as if something sound will issue from it to say Mama and Jonathan and Horatio and Nettie and Ulysses and Nimrod and Daddy Zenobia Zephira Lucius Professor Lowe President Lincoln hands him someone help me but only the gas hisses in ascent as I pull on the string as I open my mouth even wider and remember to John Keane Thank you, John Keane, so much for being a Writer's House Fellow. Thank you all for braving the elements this morning. There's probably plenty of brunch left. Um, John will be right here for a little while, so if you want to purchase a copy of either of these two books, Counter Narratives or Annotations, you can get them from Tasha, or if you brought your own, John, I think, would be happy to inscribe uh, your copy. Once again, let us thank and praise John Keane for being with us today. Have a great day, everybody.